Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Levinson. I'm a uh, real estate and business partner here at the Cooley office in San Diego, and we're very pleased uh, to be able to host this uh, combined Stanford undergraduate business school, law school combined event. Uh, great turnout. Um, and uh, I will turn it over to Samantha Begovich, who did an amazing job to really plan this entire event and, and put it together. Terrific job, Samantha. Thank you very much, Michael. Oh, no. And that, that was Michael Levinson, a co-chair of the Stanford Law Society. My name is Samantha Begovich, and I'm a 1994 graduate of Stanford Law School, and I'm one of the co-chairs of Stanford Law Society of San Diego. And it is a great privilege and an honor to introduce to you a gentleman who is a businessman, who is a catalyst for social change, a financier of social change. He is a champion of the United States military. He is a benefactor for medical research. He is an innovator, a philanthropist. He is a dedicated father and a grandfather. Can't be all of those things. <laughs> <laughs> He's an inspiration, a sailor, a son of San Diego, and lastly, a son of Stanford. And so, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Malin Burnham. <clears throat> Thank you, Samantha. I appreciate all of that, and uh, it's nice to be here amongst friends. But it reminds me, as I look around uh, the crowd here, uh, there are very few of you that I really know. And that brings up something that wasn't on my script, but you know, the great thing about <coughs> what's happened in San Diego are <coughs> the immigrants that are in San Diego. Now, I have a second definition to the popular definition of an immigrant, of course, is somebody born in a foreign country and now in the United States is an immigrant. Well, there's an equally important, maybe even more so to me, and that's anyone uh, who is living, working, and playing in San Diego County, but was not born in San Diego County. <laughs> so let me have a show of hands of those people who were born in San Diego County. Okay, this is very, this is very typical. About five to 10% is typical. And it's you immigrants that are building this place. It's not us, it's, it's not us uh, natives, because we're outnumbered. Right here, we're, we're outnumbered <laughs> nine to one. Uh, and you know, that's, it's very, very important to kind of understand, I think, the background of San Diego and. And, and who we are and, and how we get things done and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, I just wanted to mention that. Um, I'm going to refer to some notes that I put together. Uh, leadership is what this is all, of, what my talk is supposed to be all about. Leadership is th the most important one attribute in the entire world. I'm not going to try to cover the world. But right here in San Diego, it is the most important thing that we need, that we need more of, and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's what I, I want to concentrate on. Um, and, and I'm going to read you just a few lines of a speech uh, that is still accurate after 90 years. This was a speech that John D. Spreckos gave back in May of 1923. Spreckles was one of the leading, the leading businessmen in those years. Uh, he owned a utility, he owned the bus company, he owned the Del Coronado Hotel, he, he owned the gas and liquor company, da da da. And uh, <coughs> he, uh, he invited a group of uh, business leaders, men, uh, and, uh, and <coughs> I mention that because he uses the word gentleman. There weren't business women in those years, or at least they weren't recognized as such in those years. Uh, but he gave this talk, and, and I just, I'm just i going to give you a few lines of it because it's, it's, it's still one of our biggest problems. Okay, it goes like this. Now, gentlemen, between ourselves, what is the matter with San Diego? Why is it not the metropolis and seaport that it, its geographical and other unique advantages entitled it to be? Why does San Diego just miss the train somehow? 
I will tell you in three words, lack of cooperation. Think about it. Think about lack of cooperation. We have no team play. That's still a big challenge that we have in San Diego. Uh, the moment, any, and I like these, these words, the moment anybody appears with any proposition of a big constructive nature, the small town undertakers get busy digging his grave. Oh, still going on, huh? Okay. Jealousy and suspicion line up the antes and knockers against any man or measure bigger than their two by four standards. 90 years later, we're still having those same kind of challenges. <clears throat> Every time we have a major project, like uh, a, uh, an addition to the, to the convention center, look at all the antes that come out. Not, not in percentage numbers, very tiny, but nevertheless, that's what we have to put up with. Okay, uh, Peter Drucker has been one of my favorite authors uh, over the years. He's now passed on, of course. And while he didn't always talk about leadership, he was talking about business principles and one thing or another. But his, his writings are still very apropos, uh, in my opinion. And, and uh, one of the things that, that he pointed out probably 25 years ago in some of his writings that I've always remembered, and that is that basically we have three parts of our society. We have government, we have business, and we have the nonprofit world. Big three, at least. And uh, the, he said 20 plus years ago that, in his opinion, the nonprofits would ultimately be the most important of all three sectors. Government is failing us right and left. Uh, the, you know, look what's happening in Washington, Sacramento, City Hall, San Diego. You know, it's not what we want. It's not what we need. So the nonprofits more and more. And some of those, just to give you an example, the, the San Diego Foundation are now that they have a new center, <coughs> the, the Center for Civic Engagement. They're, you're going to hear more about their work uh, in the future than we've had in the past. United Way is really buckling down and, and uh, has three focuses now and, and doing a lot of outside work. The YMCA's and others. So these, these are the organizations that, that you're going to hear more of and take more of the leadership role. Another favorite author uh, of most everybody's in the business world certainly is Jim Collins. And uh, one of the interesting things that, that uh, he uh, discovered, his, his main book, of course, is Good to Great. And he was, uh, after he'd written it, and a couple of years later, he was giving a talk to a group. And in the Q&A, somebody got up and said, well, Mr. Collins, he says, uh, you know, some of the things you've just told us don't work in the nonprofit world. And he was kind of taken aback because his, whole, his book uh, was all about the profit, uh, the, the business world. And, uh, and this fellow explained why. So anyway, Collins and his team spent uh, the next couple of years uh, researching the nonprofit world and wrote a sequel to his book. It's about that thick, kind of a third, 13th chapter. It's all red bound and one thing or another. You really can't miss it when you go through a bookstore. And it's, it's all about the differences between the for-profit world management and the non-profit world management. For instance, and I won't go into much of it, but, but and in, in, as far as leadership is concerned in business management, uh, in the for-profit world, it mostly has to do with power and position and title. In the non-profit world, you can't lead people that way because everybody in the nonprofit world is pretty equal. Ideas sift from the bottom, and they're just as important as any ideas that come down from the top. And, and uh, so it's in the nonprofit world, as he points out, it's about persuasion. You have to persuade people, whether they're higher than you in rank or lower than you in rank, persuade these, everybody that what you're talking about makes sense. Whereas in the for-profit world, somebody some executive vice president prints out an edict and everybody's supposed to follow it. So think about that. Uh, in, <coughs> in, it, there is a, 
distinct difference between the, the two areas. Uh, I, I could tell you some incidents, but I don't think I need to go into all of that. Um, the, um, now, uh, I was, uh, let me give you a, a personal experience of mine. And that was when I, this goes back 50 years, and when I was trying to build our small family real estate brokerage, insurance brokerage, and mortgage lending business, during the, during the 60s and 70s, San Diego was being invaded by the national firms, the Coldwell Bankers in the, in the real estate world, and the Alexander and Alexander in the insurance world, and sending, opening branch offices in San Diego. And uh, the Burnham family had no interest in being a national firm. We, we, being a small regional firm, yes, but mainly a San Diego firm was, was our interest. And we've always thought about quality versus quantity, but in any event, I saw these people coming into the town with a lot more resources, people and capital than we had. So to, uh, I went out and talked to maybe a half a dozen of my uh, mentors, people that were 15 years older than I. And I said, you know, how am I gonna compete with these people? And what it came down to was that I should, as the leader of the firm, need to go out and, and no San Diego community better than my competitors if I wanted to survive. So I got into the nonprofit world selfishly. I wanted to survive my business. And uh, knocking on doors and so on and so forth, as our company grew, I insisted that, that everybody in our company, more or less, needed to be in the outside world doing their, their making their contribution. So we ended up being able to uh, open more doors and get more telephone calls answered than if we just stayed the way we were before. So that's how I got into the nonprofit uh, world. And uh, just to give you uh, the next chapter on that, I guess, would be that I decided earlier in life uh, I wanted to uh, <coughs> convert full time into the nonprofit world rather than stay in the for profit world the rest of my career. So uh, in 1986, uh, I sold uh, my company to my managers. Uh, I uh, retain no business interest whatsoever in any company. I'm not on any business boards, and I just converted full time uh, into the nonprofit world. And uh, and <coughs> and I've had I've never had so much fun in all my life, as a matter of fact. Uh, and one of the reasons is I don't have a whole lot of competition. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. I'm one of the very few, and it's my choice. Not you know, not that anybody else ought to do it, but but I'm uh, I'm one of the very few that spend full time, 50 hour a week. Uh, I keep an office, and I have a full time assistant, Kathy Rogers, back in the room here, uh, and uh, I, uh, uh, I, I I I guess I'm one of the very few in the community full time that works on multiple different with multiple different nonprofit organizations. A lot of people work full time for their church or full time for this, full time for that. And I'm not being critical. I, just just my style. And by the way, uh, I'm one of those guys that that uh, even though I graduated as an engineer, uh, I uh, I'm not a technology guy. Uh, I've never owned a cell phone, and I don't know how to turn on a computer. But I did learn a lot in engineering about time and motion study, and I am more efficient in that regard than anybody else, in my opinion, because I don't get interrupted. Uh, when I want to answer my emails, I go into Kathy's desk and I pick a stack of papers like that. And I can go through those real quick, and she answers them. If well, not all of them, but <laughs> the ones I want answered. Uh, so anyway, there are different styles, and and that just happens to be mine, and and it works. So maybe it'll work for other people as well. Uh, one of the other things uh, that uh, some of you know me for, and that is that probably. Upwards of 10 years ago, I got disgusted with people being selfish in their world, in their lives. 
uh, and especially in the nonprofit world, the community world. And so I, I, I came up, I don't know how, probably, a lot of my best ideas, by the way, sometime arrive between 2 and 3 a.m. <laughs> and I even get up and write notes uh, once in a while on some idea that came to, I don't know how these things happen. But anyway, I, I decided that we ought, to, we ought to have an effort to get people to think in terms of community before self. Community before self. If the whole world would do that, it would be a perfect place. Uh, if San Diego would do more of that, it would be a better place. And uh, so just think in your own lives, uh, when you got a decision to do it this way or do it that way, allow the community to be more important than us individuals. And that's, that's really, it's really, you, you can't lose, you can't miss if you take that attitude. It took a while, but I finally got Papa Doug Manchester, uh, late last year, I guess it was, to put those three words on Section B, local section, masthead. And so you'll see it in the UT. Uh, and I wish he'd put the words a little bigger, but <laughs> nevertheless. Uh, <clears throat> let me give you some kind of one-liners here that are part of my philosophy. Uh, I always assume that I'm on a team and I act accordingly, not on my own behalf. As a matter of fact, I've had a lot of successes in life uh, and failures. But of all the successes, uh, including racing sailboats and whatever, I've never accomplished anything of any magnitude by myself. Never, ever. Never won a sailboat race by myself. Always got a team. And the person on the front of the boat is just as important as the guy in the back of the boat. Uh, so uh, that it's teamwork uh, has always been my philosophy. I, I like to keep a to-do list good old yellow pad. Uh, I, I generally keep it updated weekly uh, and it reminds me of the things that I need to do, which I can forget real easy. Uh, so uh, t a to-do list makes sense for me. Uh, another thing that, that I think that I advise people on is to question from time to time statistics. We read all kinds of numbers, and they're not always accurate. Uh, if you read uh, something from uh, Fox News or hear something from Fox News, you know kind of how it's going to be slanted. The same can be said for CNN and so on and so forth. But here's, here's, my, here's the one that, that really is kind of amazing. Uh, Many, most companies will go out and do a research report to ask people, would you like this product? Would you buy this product if we built it and sold it? And so on and so forth. Well, there was one person in this innovation world that didn't even pay any attention to polls or research of that nature whatsoever. The name happened to be Steve Jobs. And he built, he designed and he built his products, knowing somehow, I don't know how, but knowing that the public would buy. And uh, so I just, I'm not saying that any of us can be a, another Steve Jobs, but just be cautious uh, when you're doing research or read research reports or uh, uh, look at uh, polls uh, of that nature. Uh, another thing that, uh, that my, our late great friend uh, uh, Dwayne Roth who died here uh, a couple of months ago in a terrible bicycle accident, one person accident. Uh, and he was really a champion at what I'm gonna say next. And that is uh, when you are introduced to a proposal of some kind, uh, a new idea, think ahead. Uh, if you say, gee, that's a great idea, let's, let's move forward. If you accomplish chapter one, and this is what, of course, political leaders in Washington could never do, if we do this, like pass a health care bill, what's the next chapter going to do? And the next chapter. And that's why that bill is in such 
horrible uh, condition, whether you, you like it or not. Uh, it's, it, we, my point is that uh, to get involved in something and you create chapter one, what will chapter two be? It may not be positive, it may be negative. So Dwayne taught me a good thing and, and he had a different expression for it. He was always looking up front for the potholes. What are the possible potholes in this idea? If you can't fix those potholes, which the city of San Diego has way too many on their streets, <laughs> if you can't fix the potholes, uh, then there's no reason to get started up front. And so I, I think that's a really a good thing. Um, my dad taught me uh, a lot about life uh, and a lot of his attributes I followed. And one of them uh, in the business world for sure is when you give responsibility to somebody, you ought to give an equal amount of authority. Think about that. Many people say have, have responsibility to carry out certain things in life, but they don't necessarily have the authority to make decisions. Uh, and everything we do, uh, it has some flexibility. So give authority, and even and my dad used to say, even if the company, give authority to your people, if they make a mistake and it costs the company money, it's gonna, that's fine. We learn from mistakes, and so on and so forth. And that's the, the last bullet point I have on, on here, and, and that is that a lot of people in taking leadership are cautious to a fault. They don't want to take a risk because they may make a mistake or they may have a failing and so on and so forth. I think I read somewhere that Thomas Edison had a, maybe a hundred failures before he built electric light. Well, if you can't take failures, you're not going to progress. And so, especially this is true today in the health science research world. Uh, all the experiments that the scientists do, I mean, uh, maybe 30, 40 times failures versus one advance. But again, once you have the failure, you put that out of the way and you don't do that anymore. You do go over here somewhere else. So leadership, you have to learn how to, how to handle failures. Uh, a couple of more one-liners. Uh, you can, I don't believe that you can be an effective leader unless you're proactive, not reactive. Reactive is defensive. Proactive is offensive, if you're in the football world. So think in terms of, of being up front, being ready to, to move, uh, always up front. Another technique that I like to use from time to time is in a, in a group meeting, I like to sometimes ask a question where I already know the answer. It's a way of getting your point out without being offensive. You're asking a question and somebody else gives you the same answer that you want, but it's theirs, <laughs> not yours. Just a little technique that works sometimes. Uh, I like to vary my approach from time to time, uh, and, and I don't use, I don't, I don't want to use these words uh, offensively, but sometimes you need to kind of bully your way through. Sometimes you need to bluff. Sometimes you just have to be a little heavy handed. Time may be short and, and you got to move forward. Uh, uh, other times you need to finesse. And so it, uh, what I see most failures in management and leadership, especially, is where somebody has a single track, and that's the way they're going to do it. They always have, always will. And uh, that's not ultimately effective, in my opinion. Another thing that leaders uh, should do, and that is be prepared to lead even if you're not in charge. Think about it. Be prepared to lead, even if you're not in charge. Let me give you a personal example. My wife and I and two other couples were in the Seychelles Islands and a few years ago, and we were going from the main island to a resort island, 
and it was an hour and a half trip in about a 60-foot powerboat. Well, the seas were a little heavy that day, and uh, when we got uh, when we got to the resort island, there was no lee shore, there was no cove, uh, and there was no pier. Uh, so uh, they anchored, uh, the crew did, and uh, called for a, a, a shore boat, which happened to be a rubber boat not much longer than the width of this table. <laughs> And they were going to put all six of us in there, plus a driver and all of our, uh, well, I guess they were going to do two trips, but anyway. <laughs> uh, the seas were going like this. You know, here you got a power boat, and this little guy's wobbling like that. And I said, oh, we're not going to step in that boat. And they looked at me. I mean, I've been there, I, I've been there many times, and I knew a lot more about seamanship than anybody else in the crew. So I decided, in the, uh, because of the safety factor, I was just going to take charge, period. I said, no, we're not going to get in that boat. I said, you see that 25-foot boat over there at, on the mooring? Go get that, and we'll get in that and go ashore. They finally did, and we got ashore, and everybody was happy. <laughs> Especially the survivors. <laughs> So, again, if you see something that is maybe dangerous in this case or otherwise going the wrong way, don't be afraid to speak up and sort of take charge. And uh, you're, you'll generally be applauded for it. Uh, I, uh, the, the question always is, uh, how, do you, how does leadership start? especially if you're thinking about a project uh, that might be built or some process that would take a number of months or a number of years. And it, I can project this better on, on a board, but not. But anyway, I like to start anything of a long future project by a dream. It could be a dream where you wake up at 2 or 3 in the morning, or it could be sitting around a table like this, probably by yourself, and just thinking into the future. And uh, okay, you come up with a dream. Now you need to put that dream into a vision. A dream, now what, what might it look like? How might it happen? In other words, I want to go to the moon. That's a, a dream. What's the vision? How are you going to get there? Okay, once you decide that, then you draw up a plan. These are all steps that I think are very, very logical and, and, and make a lot of sense to me at least. So you draw up a plan on paper, and the computer, whatever it is, and then it turns into a project where you bring in more people, more experts, and so on and so forth. And pretty soon, you, the starting gun goes off and you start building the product. Could be this building, it could be a keychain that I was just given, uh, could be anything. And then what do you have when it's finished? you have a legacy. And uh, so uh, th that's the way I think uh, uh, <clears throat> a good leadership, good planning for especially major products and major processes and so on and so forth. Um, in, in this regard, uh, well, I won't get into Balbo Park 2015, but and, and again, I don't want to be critical, but uh, we've, we've had the opportunity uh, in that situation for our 100th year celebration to really put on a wonderful uh, exhibit and program and all for San Diego. And for whatever reason, it hasn't happened and it's getting, the, the, the time is getting short and whatever celebration we have may not be a 12-month celebration, it might be a six-month celebration or whatever. I'm not involved. Uh, at least not yet. Uh, <laughs> but uh, again, if somebody had taken the dream and the vision and the plan and the project and 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 put it all together uh, on paper, uh, I think we could we would have been way ahead of where we are today. Now, uh, I believe that leaders can be taught as well as just being born. There's a lot of argument on that uh, in, in society that are, 
aren't teach aren't leaders natural leaders just born with it some of them are but i believe a lot of them are taught to be leaders so i think it can be a matter of both in that regard um i've been involved uh, been, had a lot of contact this year with the gallup organization and i used to think the gallup organization was nothing, nothing but a pollster well uh only 25 percent of their business is in polling and they're in the process by the way of getting out of the political polling because as i mentioned earlier so many of the polling people broadcast newspapers you know that how slanted they are either to the left or to the right so uh, more and more of gallup's work is in is is in consulting worldwide and uh, they uh, uh, jim clifton uh, who is the CEO, it's a private company, and I think he owns a majority of it, he and his family do. Uh, he's written a book uh, which, I, which got me on to, to uh, uh, the Gallup organization. I'd never had any contact with him before. It was written late last year, I think, and called The Coming Jobs War. And basically, he's telling us how jobs are gonna be created and it's gonna be done primarily in cities. Uh, as opposed to throughout the country. And he's looking at America in particular. Well, uh, he came and gave a talk to uh, our annual meeting of Economic Development Corporation uh, probably April of this year uh, when I met him for the first time. And uh, he said he would like to send me a paper that he had just previously written, a three-page paper, which basically was entitled uh, Entrepreneurship Trumps Innovation pretty simple statement and pretty true statement. You can be a great innovator, but if you can't sell it, can't move it, you can't get it moving, it isn't worth anything. So think in terms of entrepreneurship trumps innovation. Turns out that uh, Gallup at least believed that you can teach entrepreneurship, which is the first time I've ever heard anybody talking about teaching entrepreneurship and also testing for entrepreneurship again uh, all new to me it turns out i was told about 60 days ago that they had uh, recently gallup had had tested 3,000 11th graders in wisconsin for entrepreneurship and they identified 150 or roughly five percent as potential, not real entrepreneurs, but potential, which is, I think, very, very interesting if we can focus on our education and training uh, in that way. Uh, I, while we're talking about teaching, uh, leadership, uh, I believe that we can teach leadership as Gallup is trying to prove at younger and younger ages and one of the things that i'm i'm very proud of is that that i was asked to get involved with a help support a new building uh a new sailing center building at the Sanger yacht club where i've been a member for many many years and it's basically for junior sailing and we start these kids out at age five or six uh, I happened to have started in the same program at age 10, and I was in that program for five years from 10 to 15. Uh, but uh, we, in the summertime, we have an enrollment of around 250 youngsters, and uh, 20 to 30% are non-members. Uh, by the way, uh, the, the club is also a home venue for six high school sailing teams in the, in the area, one of which uh, is over the probably for the last five years has been the national champion high school sailing team. Well, but here's my point. Uh, I, I, uh, I told uh, the Commodore that I would, I would help with this building on one condition, and that is that I want these youngsters, this is a, a year-round program, but it's heavy in the summer. Uh, I want these youngsters uh, taught about values and virtues things that I was exposed to between age 10 and 15. 
And uh, not that I learned them all, but I was exposed to them. And I said, I want these words also permanently put on this building, uh, which they are in three different places. So if I have a legacy at, with that particular project, it's the values and virtues. Now, what am I talking about? Simple things that anyone can learn, especially youngsters. Plan ahead, meaning set personal goals. Commitment, take responsibility. Hard work, be prepared. Dedication, never give up. Teamwork, everyone contributes. Play by the rules, be honest, ethical, and fair. Follow through, take action to achieve your goals. These kinds of things, it's, all, it's really about teaching leadership at the very earliest age, whatever it might be. And, uh, and it's a, we all know it's easier to teach people when they're young than to teach people at my age. So, uh, I think I'm ready for some Q&A. So. I have a microphone here if we have any questions that anybody would like to ask. Any hands? Don't be bashful. Hi, uh, Doris Lee McCoy, and uh, thank you so much for those comments. Particularly since you were personal, I think it helped us all to relate to you in a way we might not have been. Um, when you started um, the Stanford um, uh, Malin, or Burnham uh, Institute, how did you build that? Was it somebody's idea? Uh, obviously, you're a great salesman to have brought Denny Sanford along with you. Could you share that with us, please? Thanks, uh, Doris. That, that's a good example of uh, building something for San Diego. And, and it's, San Diego is very unique to have these uh, kind of organizations. Well, uh, the La Jolla uh, Cancer Research Foundation was founded in 1976 as the predecessor for what is now Sanford Burnham Institute. And it was all about cancer. And I was asked by two of my friends then on the board of that organization to join the board. Well, 30-some um, years ago, uh, I didn't know anything about cancer. I didn't have any emotional tie to it. It wasn't in my family uh, or friends at that age anyway. But I, I said I'd take a look. And here's what I saw that I could not identify by a word for another seven or eight years. In those days, scientists were doing their science without anybody being able to see what they're doing because they might steal my secret. This, th this couple, Bill and, and Lillian Fishman, came out from Tufts University. They knew nobody in San Diego, uh, nobody in California. Uh, they set up a two-bedroom apartment in downtown La Jolla and put the lab in one. Now, this was before I met them. Five, six years later, I'm now going through their laboratories, and I'm seeing it's all about networking. It's about partners. It's about family. Uh, everybody is working together. There were no silos. And, I, and I, it was so different than everything I knew about research. And so I was intrigued, and so I agreed to come on the board. Uh, well, it took another seven or eight years before my vocabulary had the word of uh, collaboration, collaboration. You know, the future of our, word, of our world is really collaborating. We can't do it by ourselves as an individual or as one country or as one region or whatever it is. So collaboration, and San Diego turns out in the life sciences field is the most collaborative uh, center anywhere in the world. Uh, and we've been able to do things. So uh, another gentleman and I uh, helped endow uh, the organization uh, in uh, year 20, uh, which would have been about 96. 
Uh, and uh, the other chap uh, did not have a family or a business and insisted that he would do the matching gift on, only on the basis that the Burnham family name would go over the door. And then along comes uh, Denny Sanford, uh, new to San Diego about seven years ago, and uh, it's his, his been one of the finest things that's happened in, in my life and in many other people's lives. But the interesting story, so that's how it all happened, all about collaboration. Um, I still can't talk the language uh, of those people. Uh, one of the reasons is that at Sanford Burnham, I think there are 37 different languages taught <laughs> in, in, in those labs. It's really an international organization. You know, it's, it's just absolutely amazing. Uh, okay, so, but just to kind of go on beyond that, to tell you how unique San Diego is, uh, Denny Sanford uh, comes in and uh, endows further the Burnham Institute, now it's the Sanford uh, Burnham Institute, up to a higher level so we can do more research. The next thing that happens is that uh, about uh, eight years ago in California, we passed Proposition 71 uh, for stem cell research. Uh, Three billion dollars worth of funding to be done all in all the work done in California. And uh, so here in San Diego, initially we, we four uh, similar organizations got together in a consortium, now called the Sanford Consortium for Regenerative Medicine, but it's all about stem cell work. It was the, <clears throat> then the Burnham Institute, Scripps uh, Health, uh, Scripps Research, Salk, and UCSD uh, Medical. Those four organizations came together. Since then, we've had a year and a half ago, La Jolla uh, Institute for Allergy and Immunization. Uh, with uh, Prop 71 funds, uh, as a starter, uh, we built a new building of 135,000 square feet on the campus at UCSD, just across the street from the Salk Institute, where we now have 400 scientists working on stem cell research. Two weeks ago yesterday, uh, you saw an announcement that Denny Stanford ponied up another hundred million dollars for San Diego to endow a new first of a kind. First, let me back up. The consortium that I just described is one of a kind in the world. Never been done anywhere before. Probably won't be done anywhere before. Well, it might someday, but you know, if you look at the Bay Area, Stanford and Cal like to do more of this than <laughs> loving each other. Uh, same thing in Boston with MIT and, and uh, Harvard. And, but we are, we are a collective uh, cluster of cooperation here in San Diego. So two weeks ago, it was announced that a new stem cell clinic, now just think how fast this is accelerating in the life science field. Uh, we're, we're, we're studying, <laughs> researching stem cells, and now we're gonna be able to use them in patients very quickly on an experimental basis. Again, never been done before anywhere in the world. So, David. I have a question for you, Nolan. Uh, apropos of election day, if you could whisper in the ear of the next mayor, whoever that might be, <laughs> the two or three things that he should be focused on if he really wants to move the city forward, what would you identify as those two or three priorities? Well, uh, first of all, I, I will make a prediction uh, as to who's gonna be our next mayor which I normally don't do, but I think it's gonna be the person that comes in second in, in tomorrow's election, today's election, sorry. Uh, and it's just a lot of circumstances I won't get into, but I really think the second place uh, in today's election will be our mayor uh, in the final election. Uh, we have to, the, the two biggest problems that we have in this country politically and in the state and in this community are one, fiscal responsibility, fiscal responsibility, and secondly, um, uh, the, the second most important thing we have to do is deregulate ourselves. We are choking but with regulations in this country and in this community, and so in order really to get us moving forward, uh, we, we just, we simply have to get, rid of regulation. I remember uh, back in early days in my business, every time somebody wanted to develop a new form 
I said, that's fine, but you gotta get rid of one. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. We just pile them on top of each other. And, and it just, so I think uh, paying attention, if, if I would like to see those two guidelines uh, in whatever the city council does, uh, whatever the board of supervisors have been doing. Uh, and, uh, there, and so I don't have any one project, certainly the, the convention center uh, expansion is something that uh, we need to move forward on. Uh, we're running out of capacity and that's the, the, <coughs> the tourism is one of our three uh, largest part of our economy with, along with the military and, and the business, general businesses. Yes, sir. Hey, real quick. Um, I want to get back to leadership since that's what your special talks about. Um, I've been always concerned, so is our Sam Stanford Club, of really promoting young students to become leaders and go to Stanford, of course. Uh, but I've kind of had this worry concern of the helicopter parents and the tiger moms that have nurtured the kids rather than the poor kid who got in Stanford who was homeless, which is my inspiration. So I want to say what you think about how to get leadership through our kids in view of this helicopter mom phenomena that kids are catered to everything. Well, uh, education is a, is a complicated business. I was uh, talking to a group yes with a group yesterday. They came to see me about how do we teach pre-kindergarten kids? How do we get them started? And this is an effort that United Way is is uh, taking up uh, because if a kid uh, when he's in the third grade can't read to third grade standards, he's probably going to be behind the curve forever, he or she. And so uh, I just it it's, has. I think we need to start uh, earlier. I think uh, that uh, we have to have more collaboration. Uh, if you look at the school systems throughout the country, you look at school systems in San Diego, uh, the unions are not part of the overall school system. Uh, I've been in meetings with the San Diego Unified people over the last couple of years, including union leadership. and. Uh, here's a question that I, I pose to this group. This group was part, there were six from the school district and six from the community people. I said, I've been asked this question and I can't answer it. What has, oh, well, let me back up. There are about 7,000 teachers in San Diego Unified and they pay dues of $106 a month. So there's about $1,000 dues or $7 million in, in revenue to the teachers union just of San Diego Unified. So the question that I was asked by my friends on the outside, I posed to this group, I said, what has, over the last five years, what has the teachers union supported, led, contributed to, to enhance the teaching quality? That was the answer I just got, the last 10 seconds. Not a, not a single suggestion as to helping the teaching process. So uh, we, have to get, we have to get the union movement throughout this country in the same room. Uh, they can't be standing way out on, on the left side or the right side either. So I can't be specific except that we need to start teaching kids younger and we need to get everybody working together and it's not happening. Yes? Along those lines, I've been involved with, up in Orange County with the schools there and I'm on a budget committee and in a private conversation with the union representative, the, the question was, why doesn't the union focus on these better issues? And he said, as, as soon as the children pay dues, the unions will focus on it. So the problem becomes, sort of I think goes back to the, the other issue you brought up, which was fiscal responsibility. How do we make that happen when the people that are making those, that are, that are responsible for that fiscal responsibility are economically driven by borrowing money and giving it to somebody who's then going to vote them back into office. It's sort of a microeconomic problem, which is they're doing the exact thing that they are economically incentivized to do. Well, somehow, and I, I don't know the answer, uh, but I'm, let me give you a couple of ideas. Uh, somehow we have to... Uh, of course, get everybody in the same room. Uh, but uh, we have to get rid of the current political system that we have. Uh, 
our, everybody agrees, I believe, that democracy is the best form of government in this country, and they're on top. Just below the democracy are two dictatorships. One of them is called the Republican Party, and one of them is called the Democratic Party. And a small group at the top of each one of those tell the members what to do. That's a dictatorship, and that's wrong. If you think of other co leading countries around the world, uh, most of them have more than two political parties. Either we need zero political parties, outlaw them all as far as I'm concerned, or we need m at least three so that they have to form a coalition. That not any one party gets a majority stake. They have to form a coalition. If you form a coalition, you're talking about getting together and making things happen. Anyway, that's a bigger problem than I think I can tackle at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, everyone, can we all join together and thank Mr. Burnham for his time here this afternoon. And to your points with regard to entrepreneurship and uh, a legacy, this is a donation by uh, alumni Jim Madsen. Is he present here still? Yes, he has a winery co-founded as a Stanford alum with other Stanford alumni families, and they are from the Paso Robles area. And this is one of his uh, wines from his private collection for 2009, and he'd ask that you enjoy it on his behalf. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, what, are you all, what are you all doing next Tuesday noon? <laughs>